afternoon, late afternoon, early evening to all of you watching us here on Chicago Comcast uh, Cable Channel 21 in Chicago. Uh, I am Minister Michael Muhammad, co-founder of the Street Peace Coalition. We come to you every week at this hour, this uh, half an hour from 5 to approximately 5.30. The Street Peace Coalition is an ad hoc, grassroots, community-based violence intervention, prevention organization uh, that is staffed completely by volunteers, invested in exclusively by its members and those who believe in our cause. And so we come to you, this is um, our third season. And so each week I have the privilege and the honor of talking to you from our perspective at the Street Peace Coalition about the issue of crime and violence in the black community and how what are its roots what are its root causes and what are its true solutions. And so each week we are trying to put forward an argument a presentation to reason with you as listeners and viewers about this issue specifically of black on black crime and so we say some things that are not politically correct we say some things that are not the mainstream viewpoint we challenge the social norms that have been propagated about crime and violence as it relates to Chicago and specifically black people in Chicago and other major cities who have similar uh, issues and challenges with regard to violence in black community. And so uh, we have over the last two weeks been trying to lay out a timeline for you, give some contextualization about this issue of crime in the black community. And, and we're challenging you to think critically about how deep this issue runs and the depth of it goes in some streams that it is not easy to accept, not easy to understand because truth has been hidden from the public. And so the Bible says you know, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. And in another place, it says the truth shall set or make you free. And so we're trying to present facts, evidence, history uh, to ascertain the truth of this issue of violence in the black community. And so as I begin to talk about several weeks ago, this, this violent behavior is not in a vacuum. It runs back some time. I began the time track looking starting really around the 50s and the 60s with uh, the treatment of uh, poor black people uh, at a federal, state, and local level. It, we've always been, especially black men, but black people in general, we have always been demonized by society in a way that has made it easy for society to uh, treat us as uh, three-fifths of a human being or as some people call second-class citizens. And even though many of us have been fortunate, many of us have been blessed, many of, of us have worked by the sweat of our brow, our sweat, sweat, blood, and tears to try to transform our quality of life and the quality of life for our family, the view, the dominant view of us as a community has never changed. And as a result of that philosophy, uh, policies, uh, laws, rules, regulations, ordinances, practices have been implemented in every level of the body politic of the United States of America. And so if we look at crime in the black community, we have to understand that this crime, this black on black crime is a byproduct of an intense commitment 
to making us uh, really hate ourselves as black people. Because when you don't think much of yourself, it becomes very easy to do something to yourself. And so the kind of uh, violence we see is what we call black on black crime. Uh, but let's understand most whites are victims of white on white crime. Most Hispanics are victims of Hispanic on Hispanic crime. Most Asians suffer crime at the hands of other Asians. The problem is, is that ours is of an intensity and of a quality that speaks to the depravity of our socialization with regard to how we view ourselves, our self-identity, our identity as a people, our self-esteem, the way we view ourselves, the value we place on ourselves simply based upon the color of our skin, the language we use to speak about ourselves and about each other, the way we view ourselves as men, our women, and our children as black men uh, view black women and black children. We cannot disconnect violence in the black community from these, these uh, uh, other root uh, causes. And so I talked about how society has a pretty much a crime and punishment attitude when it comes to crime in the black community. And the hypocrisy of society continues to run deep. Because if we just take as a great example the current position of uh, the president all the way down to the dominant institutions in society, including law enforcement, over the current so-called opioid crisis, a crisis that has existed, oh, for 30 years at some, in some form in the black community, but now that it is crossed over to, to uh, dozens, hundreds, and thousands of whites in, in white enclaves, in white neighborhoods, uh, middle class, upper middle class, et cetera, who are now dying, who are now being severely injured, whose futures are being uh, uh, threatened by the spread of opioids, who, which, by the way, have been uh, distributed by medical doctors primarily and, and some on the street level. Now the attitude is treatment. Now the attitude is psychiatric and psychological and medical response. Well, that same crisis has existed among black people at least since the 80s. And do, from the 80s, really up until right now, we, uh, the response to our crises has always been crime and punishment. And so when you look at the, the, this attitude, you see that in Chicago, we have a current administration here locally that has plenty of resources when it comes to dealing with us at a level of crime and punishment, but has few resources when it comes to remediating how we're habilitated, starting with our education process at a five years old and moving forward, how we're treated when we are incarcerated. When you look at these practices and policies when it comes to black and brown people, there is a different disposition. And so we need to confront the root causes. Otherwise, we are wasting time talking about we need more police. We're wasting time talking about we need the National Guard. These things do not solve uh, the root causes of violence in the black community. They only exacerbate them. Because if you have taught me to believe that I am less than, if you have taught me to believe or socialize me in a way 
that traps me into the thinking that I have to be a criminal. I have to be slick. I have to be shady. I have to be conniving. I have to be ruthless if I ever hope to have a few dollars in my pocket. If you have encoded this in my way of thinking about myself now on the outside world and you decide now to continue to put in more law enforcement all the way up until the National Guard, well, the presence, the image, and the interaction of more law enforcement, what it does psychologically to me is it reinforces, it causes me to double down on the negative view, the negative uh, identity psychology that you've already socialized me into. And so I, I feel that uh, this is um, a part of what I uh, come to expect. I expect no more out of my social environment except law enforcement or militarized state in my daily living. And so this is a trap. And the wise people uh, who help engineer social construct understand what I'm saying. And so it's not an accident that we keep getting tax increases to support law enforcement well, well, it's not only to support law enforcement, it's also to support the, the greed and corruption and the bad ideals, the failed vision of those who handle the public's money, who loot and rob pension funds and other funds uh, for their own corrupt schemes. But that's a whole nother subject. Uh, it's not an accident that we have a police department with over a billion dollars, almost a billion and a half dollar budget every year where law enforcement is get, has gotten last year, I think over $200 million in overtime. And, and that's, a, that's a guesstimate because they don't even have technology in place to track uh, uh, who's getting what when it comes to overtime. They, they've, they've, uh, they've uh, got a over $30 million seizure fund that goes to organized crime units in the Chicago Police Department when they pull you over and take a car or take a piece of jewelry or seize a home, they, 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 they sell that and they put that money in the police coffers. They got, they got over, along with all of this law enforcement, you got over $600 million in taxpayer monies paid out for settlements for the brutality and the murder of policemen on black people uh, predominantly. We have gross uh, mismanagement and corruption by the Chicago Police Department, while at the same time, the mayor and the administration each month, each week is telling us why they don't have money to enrich the educational process of poor black and brown people, which that is a critical part in reversing this, uh, th this violent behavior in the community. I have a call. I'm going to go to the caller. Caller, go ahead with your question or comment. Yes, sir. This is Ray. How you doing, my friend? All right, Ray. How are you? Okay. You know what? I think here you have all the big cities run by Democrats with all the trouble, especially in Chicago with that Rahm Emanuel who does nothing for the city except take the money, go on vacation, come back, cry a little bit when a little child is killed, and then right back to his office and on vacation. But the thing is, black men, African-American men, like anyone else, they make babies and they're gone. Who's there to raise them and children? Not the man. Then, Thank you. This, you, know, you got all this rap talking about bees and hoes and, and uh, smoking dope. And what, in a, what kind of stuff? The kids don't want to go to school. They want to listen to rap. What kind of stuff is that? The mother and father don't care. If there's a father, we got to start raising our children, all of them, or it's, gonna, it's only going to get worse. Okay? Thank you, Ray. Well, the fact is, Ray, in a large way, you're correct. But you have to understand that it is not in the nature of any living creature to abandon its offspring. 
whenever you see any living creature, and I'm talking about all the way down to insects, uh, before we even get to human beings, it's totally unnatural for a human being to abandon its offspring. The only time you do that is when you have suffered some uh, trauma that makes you other than your natural self and you're placed in a socially engineered construct that encourages you to do so. And that's why I began talking about how, look, since we came here, black people, in 1555, black men have been targeted to be removed from natural relationships, from building families. This, look, we, we, we got to have stop having a short memory. It was law that we couldn't marry. Okay, it was law that we couldn't make families in chattel slavery. And then out of chattel slavery became, it became policy uh, to incarcerate black men on petty crimes. This goes way back. And so when we fast forward to so-called modern times with even uh, federal housing policy, as I mentioned, look, you couldn't, a black woman, a poor family, uh, was forced to put the father out of the home according to federal housing practices and policies. So if you had the father there, they would not allow you to stay in subsidized housing. They would not allow you to get public assistance until you got on your, they wouldn't give you anything. And so they had staff that were paid money to come in the projects, to come in subsidized housing, to come in public housing at night and in the afternoon and, and knock on your door unexpectedly to see if daddy was there. And if daddy was there, he had to leave or they would cut you off and they would put you out of your house knowing that you're poor and you're there in subsidized housing because you, you're coming up from poverty. And so this was fed, this was done across the United States of America. It set a tone among black women that you could not have a husband. You could not have the father of your children in your home because, and, and on the other side of that, black men had limited employment opportunity. So we got to look at the, at the practices and policies of the dominant institutions in society that have created a culture among black men. It's un, we're unconscious of it. We don't know how uh, we've rolled into a kind of cultural kind of thing that has some very negative connotations and negative cultural practices and where they came from. We just grow up in the culture of the environment and wound up picking up bad habits, negative traits, but nobody is you know, our educated class, our leadership, those who, who could help us open our consciousness and track. This is why I'm talking about the disparity between law enforcement money and public education. Because public education would make us aware and educate us and equip us with social, psychological, emotional, and financial, economic skill sets that would allow us to break up this this culture of uh, of absenteeism uh, 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 and, and, and disjointed families. So we've got to understand, uh, uh, caller and listeners, that the behavior, the negative behavior you see, is not natural to black people because it's really not natural to any people. It's just that we have been targeted in a way that other groups have never been targeted except maybe the Native Americans. And so there's some extreme behaviors that we take out of context because we don't, we don't really look at history. We, we are a mass media people. We believe the headline. We believe the talking head without doing, because we don't have any context. And so most of us are mentally lazy. And so we go to church and whatever the preacher says, that's all we know. That's all we believe. We turn on the television, whatever the anchor says, that's all the information we have. We don't know 
it, about the politics of uh, national news or local news. We don't know the politics behind the scenes and the agendas of editors and producers and television station owners. We, we, don't, we, we don't think that deeply in America. In fact, Americans, we're probably the most uninformed electorate in the so-called modernized world. Even though we're surrounded by wealth and we all, we, we have the power to vote, we're, we're, we're probably some of the most uninformed electorate anywhere on the, on the planet in a so-called first world country. And so we analyze problems from a superficial perspective, but it has been crime and punishment, Chicago Police Department, a CHA federal housing policy in combination with DCFS and its policies with uh, a youth that they have under their care and their service, IDOC, all the way up to the federal level with the DEA and the White House. We can draw a direct correlation between black-on-black -black crime and violence in Chicago and other major cities, but specifically Chicago, because we, you know, we, we're doing it, uh, but other major cities are not left out. We can draw a direct correlation between what's going on in our community and social engineering, the ideal the, the, the perspective, the attitude, the disposition, the internal feelings, the visceral hatred that people of power have for black men and women and brown men and women in this country. This is just not uh, what we call rhetoric. Th these things translate into power because when you have power, you can pass a law, you can make a rule, you can put money behind what you feel. You, you can put resources behind your bias or your hatred or your bigotry or your racism. And this thing, this is very real. So when you talk about rap music, you talk about the negative, violent music, well, that's, that didn't, that we can talk about the history of that. That's not by accident. It's not, look, when you miseducate young black men and you drop them in an environment where they, they believe that the only way to feel any self-worth is to sag their pants, grow some dreadlocks, carry a gun, talk tough, be tough Tony, smoke weed, and all of the other kind of, uh, you know, uh, non-productive behaviors that we fall into. And, and, uh, when you drop them in that environment and then you come and give them a record deal, what else do they have to talk about? They don't read books because you've turned them off on reading and education. You, don't, you you flooded the schools with people that don't look like them, that don't relate to them, that don't grow up where they grow up, all of the teachers that could identify with them, that could discipline them, that could hold their attention. You force them out of the public education system, and you go to the suburbs, and you bring in people from the suburbs, you bring in people from wealthy white enclaves, and you enrich them financially by becoming... Uh, uh, so-called educators, but they really can't educate anybody because when they meet Johnny and Pookie and Ray Ray, Johnny, Pookie, and Ray Ray are too strong for them to handle, and they don't know what to do because in college, they're not trained on how to manage a classroom with a young man whose mother is on crack or whose grandmama sells drugs or whose brothers have been are incarcerated in a deep and street gang life. They, they don't know how to relate to that. They don't know how, what to do with the angry young black male. They don't have a clue. And so, and then you, 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 you're disconnecting them from any, uh, excitement about education. So yeah, they're rapping about drugs and guns and all kind of in, in, uh, you know, uh, anti-social stuff, but that is not by accident. That is by design that you can get a record deal rapping about ignorance and those rappers who try to elevate the consciousness of their listeners don't get a record deal. You don't see them on television. You very seldom hear them on the radio. That's not by accident that every radio station that caters to black people has ignorance on it day and night. Well, we don't control those institutions. And so I'm out of time for this week. 
Uh, the time goes back by very quickly. And so I, I want to continue this uh, conversation as we move through the season. I hope you will tune back in to us next week. Uh, I may bring on a guest so we can expand this look at what we've been talking about. I want to thank you guys for tuning in to the Street Peace Coalition on Chicago Cable can, uh, Channel 21, CAN-TV. This is Minister Michael Muhammad signing off.